Welcome to this video lecture on intelligence testing and neuropsychological assessments. It's helpful to understand at the very beginning that intelligence tests and neuropsychological assessments are useful, however, quite time intensive and require quite a degree of expertise to administer and thus are not typically administered by counselors. Thus, we will review what you need to know as a counselor in this video lecture so that you have familiarity when you see these types of assessment reports. The focus here is not actually administering them, rather understanding their results. We're going to begin with intelligence assessment. First, it's important to understand the difference between intelligence versus aptitude versus achievement testing, so we'll go through that in just a moment. Then we'll learn about models of intelligence, learn about the intelligence quotient, what that is, IQ, and then learn about limitations of intelligence testing that are important to understand when you're reading a test result in regards to intelligence. So what is intelligence versus aptitude versus achievement testing? Intelligence testing measures what's known as IQ, or intell intellectual quotient, intelligence quotient, also known as mental ability. Tests that measure this include the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, the Wechsler uh, 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 Intelligence Scale for Children, the Stanford Binet, the Slauson, which is a smaller, more reduced intellectual test. And basically, we're trying to get at a person's verbal IQ, so that's their ability to process uh, verbal information, their understanding, their fund of knowledge relating to verbal things, um, also their processing speed, their ability to perform mathematical calculations in their mind without writing them down, uh, their ability to have spatial intelligence and awareness. So intelligence here means a person's raw ability, if you will. Okay. Aptitude is a little different than raw ability or intelligence. We're talking here about a person's potential ability to acquire knowledge or skills. Okay. And by aptitude testing, we're looking at things like the SAT, the ACT, the GRE, the MAT, the MCAT, the LSAT. So in other words, we're looking at how predictive are you going how, to what degree are you going to are we going to be able to predict that you'll be successful in college? To what degree are you going to be successful in things like law school, for example? And so these tests are meant to somehow kind of get at as how how successful you're going to be. Um, and of, of course, one of the controversies to things like the SAT, the GRE, is that they're not 100% predictive, meaning a person could get a fairly low SAT score and do really well in college. And likewise, a person can get a really high SAT score and, and bomb out of college. So they're not a, the, the most perfect predictive tools, but they're used for that purpose. Another famous aptitude test, of course, is used by the army to help place people in certain um, um, positions within the armed forces. Next, we have achievement testing. Achievement testing is different than intelligence and aptitude testing in that it measures knowledge and skills related to certain content areas. So here we're focused more on content areas than we are about raw intelligence, raw ability, or potential ability. So we have the RAT and the WIAT, the Wide Range Achievement Test, the Kaufman, but also the Wexler Individual Achievement Test. Those are basically trying to survey, do you have, for example, a fifth grade reading level? Uh, do you have the, uh, the, uh, the amount of knowledge and skills that we would anticipate based on your chronological age? Okay. These are usually compared with intelligence testing results because let's say if you have a high intelligence testing result and a low achievement testing result, it means that there's something going on in your educational level, in your education, that needs to be addressed. And that's where you start getting accommodations or individualized education plans written because you may, for example, have a problem with processing uh, words. You may have dyslexia, for example. But it's not like you're not intelligent. It's just that there are limitations or barriers to your learning of that intelligence. And that's resulted in these problems with lower uh, levels of knowledge and skills related to a certain content area. There's also a very famous test called the Woodcock-Johnson. 
that is also used primarily for achievement rather than intelligence, though it Woodcock Johnson is kind of an interesting one because it also contains items that kind of tap into intelligence as well. Okay, so that's the difference between the three. Next we're going to learn about how intelligence testing as a field developed. And as you'll come to see, intelligence testing was really the first forays into psychometrics. Francis Galton, Sir Francis Galton, is a very important figure in psychological testing and also in, in intellectual assessment. He was one of the first to employ questionnaires and surveys to gather data about human populations. His own life was changed after his cousin, his cousin was Charles Darwin, published Origin of the Species in 1859. This began a discussion about eugenics, nature versus nurture, and that discussion fascinated Galton, particularly the role of heredity in the acquisition of intelligence. What role did a person's biological ability influence how intelligent they were? His research looked at first and second degree relations and adopted family members. And he had published a work called The Hereditary Genius based on this research in 1869 10 years after Origin of the Species was published, and you can tell by looking at the title Hereditary Genius that he was quite influenced by his cousin. As with his cousin, as with Darwin, Galton also advocated for selective breeding in parenthood. This is known, of course, as natural selection, um, based on Darwin's theories, and is very controversial today and would have been controversial back then as well. Okay, next we have Cattell, James McKean Cattell. He's also a very famous person in intellectual assessment because he was the first person in the U United States to publish a dissertation in psychology known as Psychometric Investigation. He was also the first professor of psychology in the United States at the University of Pennsylvania. And Cattell emerged when measurement of human behavior was viewed as a pseudoscience. For example, something called phrenology existed at the time which was measuring personality traits by the shape of the human skull. Cattell believed that the study of human behavior needed more quantitative evidence, common to other hard biological sciences, and coined the term mental test. His mental test included tests of memory and simple mental exercises, but unfortunately, because we were still in the early days of intelligence assessment, his mental tests were not effectively correlated with either intelligence nor achievement. And so Cattell's work wasn't that influential in terms of whether we use it today or not. However, his ideas were influential as we'll come to see. This is Cattell's model for intelligence, which he had updated um, uh, throughout his life. He essentially argued that there was a construct for intelligence called G. He just labeled it G. I don't know why G, why not F or N or whatever, but he called it G. And he believed that intelligence consisted of two factors, what we call fluid intelligence, or GF, and crystallized intelligence, which we call GC. Now, what the heck does that mean? Fluid intelligence, GF, that's the bubble to the top left, is m meant to be biological or genetic, culture-free to some extent, and is measured on things like the Wexford Adult Intelligence Scale with things like digit span, and spatial thinking. In contrast, crystallized intelligence, or GC, that's the call out or the, the bubble to the bottom left, is measured by, or is, consist of, I should say, acquired or learned kinds of forms of intelligence rather than biological, genetic, culture free, and is quite actually impacted by a cultural, social environment, educational setting, for example, how good the school is that you go to. And this is measured with things like verbal comprehension on the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. So he saw two different components of intelligence, and that was still, to this day, is quite influential in how we think about intelligence. Alfred Binet is one of the next major figures in intelligence testing for us to talk about. Binet is actually... Uh, uh, has a lot of wonderful traits, and we really owe a debt of gratitude to his work. In the early 1900s, Binet uh, came of age, if you will, became more famous um, at an age when 
in France, children had just been required by law to attend school. And the French government needed a method to determine which children would need additional assistance when they entered school. So they commissioned Binet to develop tests for this purpose to decide which children needed additional assistance. Binet then recruited his colleague Theodore Simon. They developed 30 short tasks initially that tapped areas not taught in school, including things like attention, memory, problem solving skills. And he had devised an original norm group of 50 students, which for the time was large and now would be very small, and tried to correlate these domains with school success, attention, memory, problem solving skills. So in other words, if you have a high degree of attentiveness, uh, uh, if you have a really strong memory, if you have solid problem solving skills, do those result in high academic achievement, high school grades or not? Based on this research, Binet and Simon developed the first intelligence test in 1905. This established the notion of what we call mental age, which was differentiated from chronological age. Your chronological age is just how old you are, what your date of birth is, what the date is now, how old you are. Mental age is different. Mental age is about how old are you relative to your chronical, chronological age in terms of your how old, how much knowledge, skills, abilities do you have relative to your chronological age? Are you advanced? Are you slightly behind the curve? And this idea about mental age eventually evolved into what we now call IQ or intelligence quotient. An intelligence quotient, theoretically at least, is mental age divided by chronological age. So in other words, how advanced are you relative to your actual chronological age? To his credit, Binet, like I said, was a purveyor of some really important ideas. Here's some of them. He was emphatic that intelligence was not accurately represented by a single score. This was an idea later championed by people like Howard Gardner, who came up with the theory of multiple intelligences. So we, again, owe a debt of gratitude to, to him for that, that he didn't see intelligence as a fixed construct as existing of just one thing, rather that people could be intelligent in a multitude of ways. Binet also emphasized the role of the environment on the development of intelligence. He didn't believe that genetics alone caused a person to be intelligent or not. And that ran contrary to some of the ideas at the time. Binet also emphasized that intelligence testing could be distorted or biased by things like the examiner's attitude, misunderstood language during the test, and lack of precision on the part of the examiner. Like I'd mentioned bias, this is also called test error, of course. So he was one of the first people to talk about test error. Binet was also one of the first proponents for mainstreaming children with disabilities. Back in the day, and this still exists to some extent in the schools that were doing much better, children who had disabilities were removed from regular education classrooms and placed in specialized classrooms where they were taught by uh, one single teacher usually and they did not interact with the regular education students. Binet did not believe this was helpful and was suggesting at the time, something that it has taken us a while to really act on, that children with disabilities should be incorporated as part of regular education. And that was really uh, a very early um, um, influence on the mainstreaming movement of, of getting more children with special needs into regular ed classrooms. So that's a bit about Binet and why we owe him a debt of gratitude. The test, the Binet-Simon test, was later translated and renormed at, in the US by Louise Terman at Stanford University and the revised version of the Stanford Binet became quite successful and is still used today. So we've talked about the history of intelligence assessment. It's now important for us to look at perhaps the most commonly used form of intelligence testing, the Wechsler scales. Wechsler was another psychologist who had developed his own intelligence test that was influenced by the Stanford Binet. The Wechsler tests have s multiple subscales or subtests. Here are the subtests, for example, of the fourth edition of the Adult Intelligence Scale, the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale. You can see that there are four categories, verbal, perceptual, working memory, and processing speed for intelligence. 
and there are a variety of tests within those subdomains such as similarities vocabulary information and comprehension for verbal block design matrix reasoning visual puzzles picture completion and figure weights for perceptual digit span that's when you have to uh, remember numbers and you have to count them backwards for example or you have to just repeat like five or six numbers in a row arithmetic letter number sequencing and then processing speed symbol search coding and cancellation that includes things like you, you have these uh, pages and pages of symbols and you have to circle certain symbols for example as many as you can in a minute so you have a variety of tests of intelligence in the, the Wexler tests and it's important for me to mention that some of these subtests are actually quite clinically relevant, not just for measuring intelligence. For example, things like digit span are quite useful uh, as a neurocognitive kind of test if you have someone who may have some impairment or thought to have an impairment on the basis of a neurocognitive disorder such as Alzheimer's. And so some of these subtests are actually used to assess for things like Alzheimer's later on in life. Okay, I need to talk with you at least for a few minutes about what intelligence quotient is, what IQ is, because IQ is typically the result that's spit out by a lot of these intelligence tests. IQ is based on the normal curve. If you remember the normal curve, basically this is a US population or any population that's large enough where you start to have a distribution that is what we call normal or bell-shaped. And essentially most people in a bell-shaped distribution cluster around the middle, around the average, and you have fewer people who are outliers towards either extreme of that average, l significantly less than or significantly more than. Okay, And that's essentially how IQ testing works the zero standard deviations if you follow that the chart in the very middle of the curve is equivalent to an IQ of 100 for both the Wexler test and the Stanford Binet that's a cumulative percentage of 50 now remember when you go one standard deviation below or above the mean about 68 percent of people fall within that and when you go two standard deviations up below or above the mean if you if you have a normal distribution 95 percent of people fall within minus two to plus two standard deviations of the mean now why is that significant well f let's just follow the IQ uh, scores and understand what these mean so if you for example have an IQ that's one standard devi deviation below the mean that is usually about 15 IQ points so on the Wexler and Stanford Binet it's right around 15 below the mean and then if you have an IQ of one standard deviation above the mean that's 15 above 100 which is 115 or 116 with the Stanford Binet so in other words there is an IQ range of about 30 or so between minus 1 to plus 1 standard deviations from the mean once you get to what we call clinical significance or statistical significance just depending on the setting that's when we look at two standard deviations, remember, from the mean, below or above the mean. Remember, 95% of people score within two standard deviations below or above the mean. Okay? Notice that a IQ of 70 is minus two standard deviations from the mean. It's basically 15 times 2. 100 minus 15 times 2. You take away 15 twice from 100, and that gives you 70. Okay, now that's important because it used to be that intelligence was essentially determined by purely by IQ score and you needed to have the magic number of 70 or less for a diagnosis of intellectual disability, what used to be called mental retardation. That was mild intellectual disability, okay, 70 or less. 55 or less used to be moderate intellectual disability, an IQ of 55 or less, and 40 or less was severe uh, intellectual disability and I'll say that once you start getting around 40 or so IQ it's actually quite difficult to test because often people don't actually have the language to respond at around 40 IQ to questions that they're asked on the test or they can't follow the directions asked of them to complete the tasks in the first place so they're untestable okay if you follow the other side of the chart 
Again, 15 IQ points is one standard deviation, so therefore, if you times that by two, you get 30 plus more IQ points is two standard deviations. So 130 IQ is two standard deviations from the mean. What does this mean? It means that when you have someone who has an IQ of 130 or greater, that is unlikely to happen by chance alone. Okay, so in other words, that person usually is seen as having gifted status because they, they are seen as having an IQ that is fairly rare, unlikely uh, to happen by chance or just unlikely in a given population. So the reason why I talked through that with you is that you understand what the numbers mean and how IQ is derived. Okay, now we're going to learn about some other models of intelligence. Gardner's model, for example, of multiple intelligences. This one is important to understand even in the context of IQ because Gardner essentially disagreed with most modern models of personality testing which give you these subtests and these subdomains. They look at how you compare with the norm group and they essentially determine what your intelligence is for a very reduced amount of prompts. For example, if you look at the, if you go back and you looked at the WACE subtests, you'll notice that they're really only interested in verbal, perceptual, working memory, and um, I believe it was processing speed. Whereas Gardner, and, and really taking a step further, the original work of Binet, believe that people actually have a variety of domains of intelligence that, that they can possess. Uh, for example, some people are quite in li li linguistically inclined or logical, mathematical, and those people do quite well in academics in school because those forms of intelligence are quite prized in, ac in academic settings. Whereas other people have forms of intelligence that are musical or perhaps spatial or bodily kinesthetic or interpersonal or intrapersonal. Maybe they're naturalists. Maybe they have existential intelligence. And those forms of intelligence are not always well tapped into in academic settings and are not well tapped into in intelligence tests. And so if, you ha if someone has, let's say, an IQ of 100 of average, okay, you may say that, well, they have average, average IQ, they're going to do fairly averagely in school and they just seem to just be, you know, have average levels of ability. But that could be missing the point because they, if, if you were to tap into, well, what about, for example, their interpersonal intelligence? They could be highly intelligent in interpersonal context, highly sensitive to how people are around them. They know exactly what to say in certain contexts. They're the person everyone goes to talk to. They're, they're good listeners. Um, that's, that's a unique skill that isn't often tapped into. And I'll add, often children who don't have linguistic or logical mathematical intelligence will feel left out, they'll feel like school is not for them, and they'll also feel that they don't have abilities where they really do, and they just haven't found those yet, or haven't. They ha those haven't been emphasized and reinforced. So I think Gardner had some good ideas about what intelligence is and why we should culturally value different forms of intelligence. Of course, we haven't really adapted to that as an education system yet, perhaps in the future, who knows. I've talked a bit about intelligence testing. It's important for me to also bring up aptitude and achievement testing. Aptitude testing really emerged in the First World War, which had necessi necessitated the need for a group classification system. What do we mean by this? Well, essentially, there were a, a large amount of recruits that were getting ready to serve in the First World War, and groups of psychologists were needed to cl classify and rank soldiers because officers were needed. And so they used two forms of testing. One was called Army Alpha and one was called Army Beta. Army Alpha was used for routine testing. In other words, for people who were English language speakers as their primary language and was a language-based instrument. Army Beta was a non-language instrument for people who either had language difficulties or were non-English speaking recruits. And that was how people were placed into officer positions, for example. Then, subsequent, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, there has been a lot of focus on different forms of achievement testing, as well as aptitude testing. Testing has driven educational achievement and gatekeeping since the 1950s. You see this in 
aptitude tests such as the SOL, the SATs, the GREs. You also see this, of course, in things like, uh, I'm sorry, in the, uh, uh, the SOLs, which are uh, forms of achievement testing versus aptitude testing. SOLs are commonly integrated into schools now, and that's how schools not only appraise individual student performance, but also how they uh, glean their funding because schools who have low SOL scores do not receive as much funds as, sco as schools who are high performing. According to legislation that was passed by the presidency of George W. Bush called No Child Left Behind. Very controversial legislation because it essentially uh, really ramped up the use of standardized tests in schools to measure academic performance. In the 1960s and 70s, counselors were hired in schools as testing coordinators to help funnel students into STEM careers because of the space race. At the time, we were involved in the Cold War and we were, of course, also involved in space exploration and there was seen as a huge need for people who had backgrounds in science, technology, education and mathematics, known as STEM, in order to compete with the USSR in space. And so it's interesting that that political landscape, geography, had caused counselors to become more and more valued within educational systems and they became hired as testing coordinators to help funnel these students into those careers. That was really the beginning of guidance counseling, what we now call professional school counseling. The 1980s to 2000s saw a rise in computer-based administrations and computer-based interpretations. What do we mean by this? Computer-based administrations are when you sit down at a computer and you take a test. And that leads to, as we'll talk about in just a moment, computer adaptive testing in the 2000s, which was a neat way of kind of altering a test ta taking approach. So with computer adaptive testing, the GRE uses this as an example. You sit down, you take a question, and if you answer correctly, the next question that the computer gives you is more difficult to ascertain whether or not you can handle more and more difficult questions or whether your score is about where it should be right there. If you perform poorly on the question, then the test gives you an easier question to see if you can answer that one correctly next time. And that, that helps the computer kind of normalize out wh what level you're at. Does that make sense? So that's computer adaptive testing. It's neat because the computer adapts the test to the individual test taker. We also have the advent of computer-based interpretations from the 80s to, to the 2000s, and that's when you have things like the MMPI. Uh, th there are basically programs that are devised and developed so that you can enter in a person's uh, test sheet, and the MMPI spits you out an interpretation guide based on a, a very rigorous uh, 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 algorithm. And that's useful for clinicians, it saves a lot of time. At the same time, there's been a need for training in how to interpret those and know which information is pertinent to the client, what information isn't pertinent to the client. So you still need some degree of expertise in determining uh, how to use information from those computer-based interpretation reports. Okay, we've talked about how intelligence testing has, and also uh, achievement testing and aptitude testing has evolved over time. We're going to now talk a bit about the limitations of achievement testing, which are very important to understand, particularly if you're reading intelligence test reports. There's some information that higher school attendance has some relationship to information acquisition, puzzles, problem solving, exercises, and abstract reasoning, and thus people who have higher school performance, oh, sorry, higher school attendance, have higher IQ scores. That's a concern because IQ, remember, is not meant to be based in whether or not you attend school. It's meant to be based on just your raw performance, your raw level of intelligence. The quality of instruction is also key. For example, lower quality schools were not, uh, children who attend lower quality schools will not receive the same kind of instruction and that may resent, uh, result in lower intelligence scores. And I want to mention briefly why that's so important. There is, uh, up until quite recently, there have been a lot of uh, controversy. There's been a lot of controversy about intelligence among different cultural groups, particularly dominant culture groups such as whites versus non-dominant culture groups such as African Americans. And you tend to see lower 
uh, mean levels of intelligence among minority groups compared to whites. And there's a lot of theorizing about why this might be. And most of the time we think it's because a lot of people who are in minority groups grow up in underfunded um, and lower quality schools and therefore don't have the same opportunities for learning as do other students and that in intelligence tests cannot be unbiased to to education and to learning in other words you can't just measure raw intelligence you're really measuring intelligence in uh, that has been gleaned from uh, being in an academic environment in addition severely neglectful or abusive environments also impact cognitive development so for example malnutrition in childhood or exposure to toxins such as lead can be a significant problem. And lead poisoning is a, a major issue uh, because it does impact intelligence as well as things like alcohol use during pregnancy, which of course can lead to fetal alcohol uh, syndrome. This is an example of fetal alcohol syndrome. You see facial characteristics there, of course, but in addition to that, there are limits to a person's uh, inte intellectual level, meaning if they're measured by, through an in intelligence assessment, people with fetal alcohol sy syndrome typically can score between the range of 70 to 100, so less than average. The other piece about intelligence testing that's important to remember is that to some degree memory declines after the age of 65, and th thus declines uh, in things like physical health, mental activities performed in later years, and continuing education, or the lack of that, is seen to contribute to where, why they, these declines happen in a person's uh, intelligence ratings or intelligence scores if they take an intellectual assessment. So when you, there's kind of this misnomer or myth that exists, which is if you take an intelligence test, it's going to give you your intelligence test for life. It's going to give you your IQ for life, and that's going to be somewhat stable. And that's not true, because there are a variety of things that can happen, including things like traumatic brain injury, which can happen before old age, of course, uh, in addition to the aging process, uh, and that can cause uh, changes to your IQ score. There's also the controversy about gender differences. There are no intellectual differences or no IQ values found between males and females, but there are some score differences on specific tasks or abilities that are measured in things like the Wechsler scales. For example, males tend to score better on visual spatial ability, uh, for example, better able to visualize and mentally rotate objects that has a large effect size, whereas females excel on some verbal tasks. Now there's a lot of controversy about this. W why is it? Is it because of socialization? Because boys are taught, for example, to um, be more capable with their hands, for example, or, or to be more spatial than, than women uh, from from a early age or not? And we don't have an easy answer to that. Um, but that's there's a finding, at least, in the research that that exists. I talked a bit about race ethnicity. Um, just to give you the specific facts, African Americans tend to score one whole standard deviation, 15 IQ points below Caucasians, that's been found repeatedly. And research does demonstrate that the differences, though, are diminishing, which is good, and it's probably related to the way in which schools are addressing some of the, the major achievement gaps that we have in this country. Hispanic Americans' IQ scores are typically between those of African Americans and Caucasians, and again, there's a theory that linguistic factors may play into this. Uh, for example, people who are Hispanic American tend to score higher on performance subtests than the verbal subtests, and the verbal subtests require more English, you know, require a better grasp of English culture, English language, if you will, or, you know, American English. And in addition to this, uh, if you're a Hispa Hispanic American, English may not be your first language, and of course this can contribute to this discrepancy. So, here are a couple of interesting intelligence assessment cases that we're going to pause for a second, give you a moment to think about, and I'll give you the answer to them. So I want you to think about the questions that are kind of proposed for each of these cases. First, your client is a five-year-old first-generation Latina 
who was given an IQ score of 84. What other information might you want to know? Pause the video for a moment and think about that. Okay, well hopefully you talked about how this is a, a five-year-old and so we want to know um, exactly how appropriate the test was for the age but in addition she's a Latina first generation meaning we don't know how good her English is and maybe language plays into this quite a bit um, but in addition to that we don't know if she's been in preschool or in school and that may have influenced the IQ score we also don't know what her test taking behavior is like for example she may have been very very shy and wanted to just avoid the questions or not said a lot in response to questions. So there's a lot of kinds of information we'd want to know. It's not a conclusive finding by any means. And again, the client is fairly young. Okay, next case, you have a 61-year-old client whose waste profile, Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, indicated major deficits in the areas of digit span, letter number sequencing, and verbal recall. He was just fired from his job of 30 plus years for not following step-by-step -step procedures on the job. Pause the video for a moment and consider what are your hypotheses. Okay, there's a couple of things you could be thinking about here. For, if you look at the specific waste uh, areas that are affected, digit span, letter number sequencing, verbal recall, a lot of those have to do with working memory. He's 61 years old. We might wonder if there's something going on neurocognitively with him. Is he experiencing early onset Alzheimer's, for example? He'd just been fired from his job of 30 plus years. So there's been a dramatic change to some degree for not following step-by-step -step procedures. You know, that obviously wouldn't have happened before now because otherwise he wouldn't have kept his job for 30 plus years. There may also have been a change in job duties, of course, and the person may have struggled to keep up with those. It's entirely possible, though the major deficits in the waste areas suggest that there's a larger problem going on. Remember, these aren't just deficits, these are major deficits. Okay, next we're going to learn about neuropsychological assessment. We learned about intelligence assessment previously. Neuropsychological assessment is becoming more common as a specialty as baby boomers age. Again, we're getting older as an overall US population. The brain is crucially related to emotions, behavior, and physiology in the body. And neurological and brain damage often causes permanent behavioral and personality changes. You may be aware of the famous case of Phineas Gage it's a fairly gruesome case, so I'm going to you know, just be brief here, but essentially he was working on the railroad um, in the 19th century, and Phineas Gage got a spike through his head that uh, had, when it was removed, he was still living. He had obviously needed uh, to be hospitalized and to heal, but even after that, his personality changed quite significantly due to damage in some of the prefrontal areas of his brain. So, for example, he became emotionally dysregulated. Uh, he became quite angry uh, frequently. He would curse where he hadn't cursed before, things like that. And the change was apparently so dramatic that it was famously written about and has become one of these famous case examples of what can happen when an area of the brain is compromised. So how would we know if the brain is compromised? What are the reasons that we would refer a client to neuropsychological assessment? There are a couple of things to be looking for here. Brain injury is one. So things like TBI, concussion, strokes, any indication of those issues, we should be evaluating neuropsychologically. It may also be helpful to differentiate a diagnosis of depression here, because of course if you are depressed, sometimes you can have a slowed cognitive functioning, meaning you don't process things as quickly. Epilepsy and, and, or seizures are another example. And we, it, it would help to use neuropsychological assessment when we have children we're working with who have autism spectrum disorders because there are often times, in fact, one third of children with autism 
develop epilepsy or, or seizures and that's a significant issue because often the child will be look, look as if they're zoning out almost in a trance and we're not sure if that's autism or if that's having an absence seizure and it's important to, to evaluate for that. Another example is dissociation. If the client is dissociating and they also seem in a trance-like state, they may well be having seizures and we want to assess. Things like problems with attention and recall could also be seen as a problem resulting from seizures. For example, if you have a seizure, afterwards you can actually lose not only memory but also lose some skills. So for example, I've worked with children with autism who have had excellent toilet training up until the point to which they have a seizure and then they lose some of those skills and then they have to relearn them again. It's also important to evaluate for conditions such as AIDS, Alzheimer's, dementia, some of those conditions to understand uh, whether or not a person has a neuropsychological impact, for example, on the basis of AIDS, or whether or not they do indeed have things like Alzheimer's, dementia, what are now called neurocognitive disorders. Here are some common assessment instruments. The SMMSE, the Standardized Mini Mental State Exam. We've talked about this, of course, uh, before. Or if you haven't learned about it yet, we'll be talking about it in class. Then there's the Bender Gestalt. The Bender Gestalt involves the copy, recall, motor, and perception phases and is a fairly intricate in, uh, uh, instrument. It requires quite a lot of training to use properly. Then there are medical tests, such as CAT scans, EEGs, and functional MRIs. Believe it or not, sometimes the WACE is often used as well to measure neuropsychological uh, functioning. And part of the reason for that, as I'd mentioned, is because um, memory, working memory, for example, is quite well assessed through a, some of the subtests on the WACE. So here's a reflection question for you about neuropsychological assessment. What types of behavior caused by a drug or prescription medication could present as a neurological deficit? Pause for a second, consider that, and then we'll revisit. Okay, there are a variety of answers you could have had here. There are quite a few. Uh, an example would be, for example, if you're taking an antipsychotic medication, those are also known as neuroleptics. Sometimes those can have tranquilizing effects. They're actually known as major tranquilizers, and that can slow down cognitive processing. Things like benzodiazepines, which are considered basically liquid forms of alcohol by some psychiatrists I know, uh, that can also alter your uh, cognitive functioning. And in addition to that, there are some uh, f different forms of medication for medical issues that can also have neurological side effects. Okay, so we've talked today about intelligence testing and neuropsychological assessment. Hopefully you get kind of an overview of those two broad topic areas, not that you're going to be conducting a lot of those kinds of tests unless you want to become a psychologist, but hopefully you have a, an understanding of what those tests are measuring and how to interpret them or understand them when you read a report that includes intellectual or neuropsychological assessment. And in closing, I also hope that you'll have the information needed to know when to refer a client who has concerns with intelligence or with neuropsychological functioning. That concludes this video lecture.